I'm Carla Schroer of Cultural Heritage Imaging, and in this video, I want to tell you about the free open source Digital Lab Notebook software, what it's about, and why you might want to use it. At Cultural Heritage Imaging, we work in the field of computational photography, and what we mean by that is that we're taking sequences of images that allow computer algorithms to then extract information across that sequence of images and produce a digital representation that's not possible from a single image by itself. There are many, many examples of computational photography, and the two we primarily work in are reflectance transformation imaging, or RTI, where we're collecting really fine surface details of a subject from a single camera point of view, and photogrammetry, where we're taking images all the way around a subject to produce a high resolution, high precision, 3D model of a subject. The Digital Lab Notebook is really about how we collect and manage data about the digital representations that we're producing. And we need to do that through the whole life cycle. How do we collect the images? What methodology did we follow? What equipment were we using? Who was involved? Why are we doing it? Where did it take place? What are we actually shooting? And then once we've collected the images, how do we process that information and potentially reprocess it to create different kinds of outputs? And finally, how are we going to prepare the data and the finished results for archival? The Digital Lab Notebook supports four technologies at this point, RTI, photogrammetry, multispectral image sets, and documentary image sets. And a documentary image set can be a variety of things. It could just be some photographs of a subject, but it could also be applying technologies like focus stacking or panoramas or an object movie. Anything where a set of images or high dynamic range images, a set of images uh, that you want to collect um, about a subject. So the core principles for the Digital Lab Notebook, when we set out to do this work, was first, it needed to be open source. We want there to be transparency. We want people to understand how the software works and what we've done, as well as to allow additional work to be done to it over time. We wanted to make it easy and natural to use, so you fill out forms um, similar to any kind of database software. And this was a big one for us because we're fundamentally photographers and we don't want to spend all of our time doing metadata. So we wanted to make it easy to collect information and reuse that information over and over again by grouping it and creating templates out of it and so forth. Because so we found in our work that a lot of things that we do, you know, once we figure them out, we do them over and over again. And so we want to be able to reuse that information, tweak it where we need to, and have good information about what we've done. The system is flexible, so you can enter as much or as little information as makes sense for you, for your project, and so forth. The software is internationalized. Um, we set it up where you can enter most of the information that you're going to need before you do your image capture or before you do your image processing. So information about your organization, your equipment, your processing, all your standard methodologies, that stuff can all just be in there so that when you go to do your work, it's very, very easy to collect this metadata and organize it. We're producing as our metadata, our primary metadata, is produced as linked open data that's mapped to the SIDOC conceptual reference model, also known as SIDOC CRM. And what's great is that you don't have to know anything about it. You don't even have to have ever heard of it. You're just going to get that data out of the software automatically, along with some other kinds of metadata. And we want to make it easy to take all of our images, our archival material, our outputs, and wrap them all up into an archival submission information package. So let's talk about that a little bit more. That archival submission that we uh, support in the DLN allows you to take the data that you've collected, which could include information about both your capture and processing, and we have a built-in tool called the inspector that can validate image sets to make sure you've followed certain rules. We can then group that together into a submission information package or a SIP. 
and you can do that after you've just created your images and done the inspection because uh, that's really valuable for most of this kind of work that's probably the most important information we can do it after we have uh, processed things into final outputs and work products and the archiver can create these SIPs in either the METS or the BAGIT format. And um, included in these packages are, in addition to the metadata and the images, manifests, uh, organized file structures based on which format package you choose, and MD5 checksums that would allow it, uh, a repository to better keep track of and manage our data. In addition to that, linked open data mapped to the, to the CRM, we also produce a human-readable HTML report, a Dublin Core record, and a Lido record. So these are other kinds of metadata that can make it easy for a variety of people to adopt what you've done. Let's take a quick look at one of the HTML reports. So, um, this is really easy to generate whenever you'd like from the DLN, and you can see all of the information that you have. It uh, has a notion of opening and closing things. It has a little table of contents here, so we can go look at any particular area, like what were the actual work products that I created um, from my tool. We can add little photos of our setups and our environment and so forth. So there's a huge amount of information and other videos are gonna get into these things. But I just wanted to show you this report because it's nice to have something that is designed for us to read in addition to these other kinds of data which are really more designed for computers to use. So one of the core, core ideas that drove us to creating the Digital Lab Notebook is that we want to do scientific imaging. We want to teach other people how to do scientific imaging so that data can be validated and can be reused and can be replicated. So the core ingredients of the scientific method are really that you have to have empirical data that you uh, keep and make available to others. In our case, that's going to be photographs. We also want to keep track of what we did, the, the who, the methodology we followed, who was involved, why we did it, all of those things um, we want to keep track of because it's not good enough to just give somebody uh, a 3D model, for example. They, they can't understand by just looking at the model how it was built and whether some parts of it maybe were created manually by hand, whether some parts are a visualization that somebody just uh, made up out of their heads. Um, and so they really need to understand how it was built to know if that data, what, what that data can tell them and the limits of that data, what that data can't tell them. Why does this matter? Well, it's really about supporting collaboration. It's about creating a situation where uh, we can enable the reuse of data, the assessment of data, and we're promoting and even thinking about how we're going to preserve and archive data at the time we're collecting it. The other key thing about this tool and our real impetus for doing it is that it democratizes technology. And what we mean there is that we want to separate the authenticity or the quality, the reliability of the data from the authority or who created the data. And what we see so often today, um, for example, with 3D models, is that people will decide whether a model is sort of good or whether they can rely on it based on who did it rather than based on how it was created, the methodology, and so forth. And our real goal here is that we want the data to speak for itself. We want people to be able to query and understand the data so they can evaluate it and understand what it's good for, what it's not good for, and whether it meets their needs. And by doing this, it really means that anybody that follows good practice um, and, and acquires skills to do this kind of work can be contributing to the world's knowledge of of objects and places and uh, things that exist in the real world. And I think the importance of this is really, really increasing as we're seeing cultural heritage sites and objects and artworks more and more and more at risk. Um, there's always time and deterioration and theft. These have been around for millennia. But what we're seeing in more recent times is an increase in severe weather events, 
in floods, in fires, in uh, rising sea levels, that is putting more and more material at risk and more and more material is being lost. So the more that we can do to make it easy for people to collect high quality data, preserve that data, share that data where it's appropriate to share, um, we think that's a great thing. And also related to this, we really want to enable communities and cultural communities to be able to document their own material and also tell their own stories, their own narratives about why this material matters, rather than having all of that happen from institutions that come from the outside um, in order to do this kind of work with specialists. Let me give you a really quick example uh, based on just a digital photo. So if somebody gives me a photo and I want to decide if I can use it for to answer a research question, um, what do I need to know about it? Well, ideally I would have the original photo. Uh, hopefully the person shot in a raw format and I would have how it was converted to whatever format I'm looking at. I would have the what's called EXIF data or EXIF data produced by the camera that tells me the settings. And I would also want to know how that image was processed. Was distortion correction applied? That could help me understand if I could measure something in the image. Um, whether the white balance or other color management tools were done if the color matters to me. And I also would want to know if contrast curves or sharpening were applied. And let's take that a little bit further. So here is an image from a Diego Rivera mural called Pan American Unity. And this is just straight out of the camera um, with a white balance. And here it is with a little sharpening and here it is with a lot of sharpening. And you can't really see it that well unless we zoom way in past 100%. And now here's the original data. Here's a little sharpening. Here's a lot of sharpening. And you can see that the actual pixels are being modified by this process. Well, that can potentially cause problems with just one photo, but in the case of the kinds of tools we're talking about, like RTI, the algorithms are looking pixel by pixel through the stack of images. And photogrammetry is actually operating on a sub-pixel level, level with the images. So if you've applied this kind of processing to the images before you put them in the software that's going to calculate uh, the, the digital representation, you could be creating things that look like scratches or inscriptions or, or issues on the surface that don't exist in the real world. So if somebody wants to use your data, they need to know whether you've done these kinds of things so that they can understand uh, how, the, how reliable the data is and, and what it, they can use it for. So the big idea here is we know how to collect using just digital cameras and some basic tools lots of information about the real world, uh, including applying a variety of technologies. And the second big idea is we also know how to build a digital lab notebook, or DLN, that records the context of what we did and the means and circumstances of how we created that digital representation. And that means the quality of the data can speak for itself. We have been really fortunate and we want to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities in funding some of the work, uh, a significant amount of the work on this project. Um, we also want to acknowledge our partners at the um, Center for Cultural Informatics that is part of the Institute of Computer Science in Heraklion Crete and uh, Stelios and Eric Leisch, who are uh, independent developers that have helped develop the software. And we've had many, many advisors from museums, libraries, uh, archaeology that have helped us uh, over years. We've had little bits of funding from various grants over a long period of time. And we're so happy that the 1.0 software is now available for download. You can get it from our website. And we also want to point you to the Chi forums where you can ask questions and provide feedback on the tools. Thank you.